Hello, lollygaggers. Ron Shelton is a legendary writer and director whose films include White Men Can't Jump, Blaze, Cobb, Tin Cup, and Bull Durham. The latter, considered by many to be the best sports film of all time, is the subject of his new book, The Church of Baseball. Home runs, bad calls, crazy fights, big swings, and a hit. Ron, thank you for the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Greg. So this book is part oral history from one of, if not the greatest sports movie ever made, part memoir, and part masterclass on script writing and filmmaking. Why did it feel like now was the best time to write a book like this? You mean like 35 years after the movie, why write a book at all, you know? <laughs> well, you know, what the, 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 the introduction to the book explains that. Um, you know, the movie just doesn't go away. It seems to be held in higher regard every year. And um, there's a lot of false stuff been written about it. And I thought, let me tell a story of what is, of, of what a hell it was actually making this movie that is life affirming and sexy and romantic and fun and also melancholic at the same time, because the making of it was a sheer war. And, um, and, and I thought also people, nobody really writes what it's about making a movie, much less writing the script. So I thought, well, let me see if there's a book here. And it turned out there was. Honestly, I mean, the, the entire book was great, but one of my favorite parts was the screenwriting process. And we'll certainly get to that in just a second. First though, the memoir part does include your upbringing as somebody who fell in love with films and then also fell in love and eventually <laughs> played baseball all the way up to AAA. When and why did you first really fall in love with the game of baseball, Ron? Well, you know, it's, it's all about fathers and sons, isn't it? My dad played. <laughs> My dad taught me. That was his sport. So sons and fathers and fathers and sons. Um, there's something from my childhood that appealed to me uh, about it. and was um, It was physical, uh, you know, for a little boy having a physical game. You got dirty. <laughs> you got to roll around in the dirt. You got to hit things. You got to throw things uh, but it was also, there's a cerebral element to baseball that I think appealed to me even as a kid. There's a lot of strategy. There's a lot of outwitting each other. Um, and then the other things, uh, you know, my mother went to Muir High School, John Muir High School in Pasadena, which was Jackie Robinson's high school. And so my parents were always talking about Jackie Robinson even when I was like four years old. And I, d I didn't know his import till later, but we were Jackie Robinson families on the wet fans on the West Coast, and he was a West Coast guy, of course, a kid, uh, Robinson. So that entered in, and my dad played in college and high school, and and I grew into it. That's all. I just fell in. I turned out to be pretty good at it. So it gave me a focus, and I think boys need focuses, and it ended up probably helping me get an education and <laughs> led to baseball. Who knew? Yeah, so after you played in college and graduated college, you were offered a contract with the Baltimore Orioles organization and assigned a spot in the low minors as part of the Appalachian League. You said that you really learned about the chasm between the intellectual and physical, that it was much greater than you had realized before this point. What was it that taught you this lesson about playing low-level minor league baseball, Ron? Well, I was coming out of at baseball as a college graduate. And I was suddenly in buses and in hotels and on the field with guys who barely got through high school. And I was an avid reader and nobody else had read a book. So I realized, and yet I love these guys. I mean, there was nothing judgmental about what I said. I come, you know, my own grandfather never got out of third grade. Um, so it wasn't judgmental, it was just, wow, we have a different set of interests in the world. And, um, and by the way, I learned a lot from those guys too. Uh, learned how to drink, <laughs> uh, but I loved them because I, I always felt a working class kind of family background. So I, I think I learned from them. Maybe they learned a little from me, but uh, we certainly got along great. But it, it was also another education to me because I was coming from a, a, a liberal arts degree in a beautiful little seaside town of Santa Barbara, California. And now I was in Bluefield, West Virginia with guys from all over the country. And uh, it was part two of my education. 
at some point during your time as a minor leaguer, you went and saw the film The Wild Bunch in the theater, and you said you came out a changed young man. Why? Well, it was in Little Rock, Arkansas. I was in the Texas League, and um, I would go to movies every day before the game. And the movie just spun me around and took, took my head off. There was so much going on in, in, in it uh, that was it was uh, about things. I, I got to figure it out. What, what's going on? And why can I not take my eyes off this movie? These men uh, who had, were nothing like me. They were killers chasing killers. And at the end of the movie, I cared about all of them. And I thought, this is some amazing storytelling here. Uh, and it was made by the great Sam Peckinpah, I think his masterpiece. One, I think it's a, one of the great American films ever. And so I went to see it every day in Little Rock. And since that time, I've sort of not only studied it, but a number of people who knew Sam and worked for Sam Peckinpah are now on my team. So um, I just think it's a brilliant movie. I recommend it to everybody. It's about loyalty. It's about... Um, the, the limits of loyalty and friendship and, and, and decisions and when to do the right thing and when to do the wrong thing and what's the cost of those decisions sometimes. And it just keeps shifting. The movie keeps shifting and growing and it ends up, I think, just being terribly moving at the end. So yes, The Wild Bunch is, is the, my touchstone. Ron, it was incredible to read the detail with which you were recounting various stages of your life, your childhood, minor league baseball, and then of course the making of this movie as well. Are you somebody who has kept a journal for a long time? Do you just, uh, are you one of those people who has a really good memory? Were you uh, reaching out to people to make sure that what you were recollecting was actually correct? How does that process go for you? I have a very strong and detailed memory, uh, especially about that period of my life. And I think it's like all my dad telling stories when he was in the war, World War II. I mean, you know, he could tell vividly detailed stories about being in London in 1944. I think. I think it's your first, when it's your first time out in the world um, and you're young and you're forming and your brain's still forming, these things really stick in great detail. I mean, I'm really good with memorizing, memorizing remembering uh, dialogue and details of what I had to eat at that restaurant on what day. So uh, much of this was memory. However, when it comes to the part of the story in the book where I'm now working with other people because writing, you write in solitary, and then you suddenly have 200 people to work with. <laughs> so once we're, once we're trying to sell the movie and I have producing partners and we're going to studios and, and then we're prepping it and we're casting it and all that fun, fun and wild audition stories in the book, then I would call people I'd work with to compare my memory to that. So um, uh, there's a story of an actor who was a well-known actor that we flew to New York to meet and he didn't read the script and he wouldn't read the script and uh, I'll let you read the book to find out who I'm referring to. Well, I called the producer that was with me and he, he said every detail of what I said is exactly how it happened. So, and he added a couple of details of his own. So I believe that, you know, the book holds up to scrutiny in that regard. Plus my assistant kept a journal so I could, which he shared with me. I didn't even know he had one, but I could compare dates because so, sometimes our memory fails us in what happened in what order. I'd remembered some things backwards. So I could, fix those things. But um, I think this is a very, well, it's a subjective accounting because it's my view of the world. But I think the events and the events in which they happened are beyond dispute. Yeah, by the way, the actor that that producer was pushing so hard, who was one of the biggest actors at that time, I think he was too big for the role of Nuke Lelouch. So I think it worked out well that he refused to read through the entire script and he ultimately had to cut him loose. Yeah, well, I couldn't be happier than with Tim Robbins, who is goofy and lovable. And, and uh, but also, you know, what I love about Nuke is it would have been easy to make a fool out of him. And he has a kind of dignity that emerges in the story, you know. And by the end, he's, he's teasing Crash and he's dropping cliches, trying to pick up the lady announcer. That was shot in Dallas, Texas, by the way, at the Ranger Stadium. Uh, um, the um, so. I, I didn't want to make fun of Nuke. That was very important to me. And I think Tim really pulled that off. Yeah, we'll get to more of that in just a second. But first, I need to ask you, you gave up baseball after quitting the minors. Uh, uh, you quit uh, your minor league career in AAA, and you didn't watch baseball at all again. 
for about 15 years. So how did you go from that to wanting to make a movie about baseball? Well, I wanted to direct. I'd written two movies, The Best of Times with Robin Williams and Kurt Russell and Under Fire about the Nicaraguan Revolution and the role of journalists in it. And they were they were not particularly successful, but they had some they had some fans, uh, you know. And I, I really wanted to direct them. And I thought if I write a story that I know better than anybody, they can't at least <laughs> fire me because I don't know the world, you know. I know how hard it was for Oliver Stone to get Platoon made because he didn't have a track record, and it was a brilliant script. And he'd living in the trenches of Vietnam. I mean, was shot out every day and lost his buddies. So, and he, that's why he he said, "I'm going to write a script, Platoon, that they have to give me the job because I I know the world." So that was my approach, and I went back and thought minor league baseball, and in a certain way, it was my catharsis. It was getting rid of the demons of. Well, I hadn't made it to the big leagues and, and allowed me to re-embrace the game. So how did that initial pitch go when you tried to convince a studio to let you make this movie? Well, I, I tried to think, what is the hook? And I thought, well, there'll be, there'll be two players. Well, if you're going to make a movie about two players in the same team, you can't be the left fielder and the first baseman because they never talk to each other. So it had to be a pitcher and a catcher because they're involved in every play. And pitchers are, are notoriously uh, eccentric. And catchers are kind of the, uh, the quarterback of the team. Um, and you know, the catcher is, is, is on, in every play of the game. <clears throat> My son just graduated from high school as the all-league first-team catcher. So I, 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 I've been young again. I would, I would have been a catcher, not a middle infielder. But, so I love the catchers. And... Uh, and then I said, there has to be a woman. Okay. So now we have a three-way love story, a menage a trois, but that's all I had. And then, then I recalled the famous Greek uh, comedy, uh, Lysistrata, which is, a, a, it's, they still perform it 2,000 years later. It's where the women go to the men and say, we're going to withhold our sexual favors until you stop going to war, because all you guys like to do is fight. And that play is called Lysistrata. And I thought, Lissa Strata in the minor leagues is a really funny idea, even though that's not much of a movie idea. That was a theme. And I pitched it as Lissa Strata in the minor leagues, and miraculously, I sold it. And then I had to figure out what the hell I sold, because I, I didn't have much more than those five words. Well, I think you did something wise. You just immersed yourself in that world once again. You go out to the Carolinas, and you start driving around – and visiting ballparks in that league uh, while games are being played. And as a matter of fact, uh, this plays into how you ultimately came up with that opening monologue for the movie as spoken by Susan Sarandon's character, Annie. Uh, just how much fun was it getting to do that part of things to really get the script writing process kicked off? Well, uh, you know, I, I, the biggest part of a screenplay to me is thinking about it before you start, <laughs> uh, staring out the window, uh, taking long walks in the countryside or in your neighborhood, wherever, just sort of contemplating, you know, it's, it's the fermentation of the barley malt for the scotch, you know, uh, uh, because when I start writing, I like to go fast. So um, I was driving around the Carolina Leagues, actually going to Asheville from Durham, and I have a little micro diskette recorder, you know, that big. And I said, well, I wonder what she sounds like when she talks, because I have to hear the characters before I can write them. I have to know how they talk. And I picked it up and I said, I believe in the church of baseball. And then I drove another 10 miles and I said, well, hmm. now, now what did she say? Then I worshiped all the major religions and most of mine. Were. And at this point, she's like the many women I knew out of the 60s who, who now it's like 15 years later and they're 40 years old and they opted to not have family or they crashed and burned a couple of marriages. And now they're at that reckoning of their life where they're wondering, have they made the right decisions? And they're really interesting women because they've tried so many things. They're on a con constant search for something um, where us guys aren't nearly as uh, <laughs> curious as the women. And uh, uh, so I just wrote the whole dialogue, the whole monologue in bits and pieces. I got to Asheville 
I put the thing back in my briefcase. And two months later, I was in LA. I was in an apartment at the time. And I said, what was that thing I wrote? And I typed it up. And I gave her the name Annie because the baseball groupies are called Annie's. I believe that all the way through, the only thing that truly feeds us all day in and day out is the Church of Baseball. And I looked at it and I wrote the whole script without an outline. So it's not the normal screenwriting process, <laughs> Trey, let me tell you that. But it, I think this was all inside me somewhere waiting to, to come out. Yeah, festering for sure. By the way, there is a hilarious story related to the terrible trade that Annie mentions in that opening speech that people should definitely check this book out for. Now, you do provide some really good lessons for aspiring screenwriters and filmmakers, as I mentioned earlier. What is screenplay exposition? Why is it so important? And how do you approach it, Ron? Well, by exposition, we mean what is the background information that the audience needs to follow the story? Because there's always something, you know, you have to clue in the audience. Um, the, the problem is when you stop the story and somebody just says, okay, he's from, you know, he's from Houston and he grew up in Corpus Christi and then his father married a woman from Puerto Rico. That's boring. That's called, that's just exposition. So you have to figure out how to show these things without stopping the movie. They have to be built into the drama. An example in, in this movie would be, we don't know much about Nuke, except he was the number one draft pick and he got a lot of money and he's got a red pore she keeps you know, bragging about. But it's a critical point in the game. His father shows up, is behind the home plate screen with a giant video camera, is filming him and he's embarrassing Nuke. That, that's what causes the meeting at the mound. You know? And then, then when he goes over to talk to Annie, he brings his father with him. Well, that, that right there, it's two funny scenes, but it tells you all you need to know about Nuke's background. What you're actually getting there is exposition without realizing it. Another way would have said, well, my father's coming to the game. And no. So that's how you hide the exposition. There's a, uh, a scene in Cobb, a movie about the last days of Ty Cobb, who was a mad genius uh, uh, baseball player, Tommy Lee Jones, and he's throwing his pills. He's in the bathroom in the kitchen of where he lived up by Lake Tahoe. And he reads the label of all these pills and he throws them against, smashes them against the wall. And it's very dramatic and almost terrifying. And then he storms out. Well, what he's just told you is that he's dying without saying it, by reading the labels of seven bottles of pills that you would only take if you were hanging on for dear life. And uh, so that's another example of how you hide the exposition. It's something I, I'm very conscious of and I try to teach to young screenwriters and remind myself of every day. I and plenty of others consider you to be the best sports filmmaker of all time. I don't even think it's close. I think you're the Wayne Gretzky of that realm. So it was interesting to read that you feel like the biggest mistake a sports movie can make is to have too much sports. Why is that? Because nobody does sports better than television or going to a game in person with a good seat. <laughs> um, I, I mean, the last time I went to a college football game, I said, I'm never going again. I used to go to college football games. And, and I said, no, it's way better on television. And because um, it, it, baseball, I prefer in person, by the way. Um, mm. Basketball's better in person if you have a great seat. <laughs> but not if you have a bad seat. And there's not that many great seats in a basketball arena. I mean, the first 12 rows. And then and hockey's good from about five rows from the ice. <laughs> it's too fast to see anything otherwise. So, uh, so in that regard, I don't think a sports movie should ever try to compete with television. They got 20 cameras. I got two. But you can take your two cameras and your storytelling all the places the TV can't go. I can go into the shower. I can go to the apartment where the guy's picking up the girl and they're having a fight. I can go on the bus trip. I can hear what the batter's saying, thinking about when he's at the plate. I can hear what the pitcher's internal monologue is. 
I can go show what the meeting at the mound's all about. You know, I, so I focus on all those moments that TV can't compete with. And, and too many sports. And also the other thing is sports movies always want a big game, a home run in the last inning, a three-pointer, a you know, 99-yard punt return, 99-yard punt return for the win. That's all nonsense. That's total BS. I mean, how many games, if you, if you watch thousands of games, actually end like that? Almost none. So I try to make them more like real life. Yeah, that's not real life. That's a Disney movie. And real life very rarely has that Disney ending. Exactly. Was there real life inspiration for the bats in the shower scene, a.k.a. the lollygagger scene? Yes. And what the book tries to do is tell it. I'll tell you incidents from my life that I remember from sports or growing up or my growing up in the Baptist church and, or my dad loving jazz <laughs> or all these contradictory things that aren't contradictory at all. And um, one of my memories from, and then they show up in the screenplay and in the movie. That's the whole point of this book is how you, you have to put yourself into, into your stories or they, they don't resonate. So we were playing in Stockton. We had a really good team, Stockton Ports, California League, and we actually won the league championship. But in the middle of the season, we had a slump. And we, so we went and our bats were all getting broken. And we hadn't got our bat order in. Because about once a month, you get your bats would come from Louisville Slugger in, in, in Louisville. You ordered bats to the style you wanted. And we kept telling the manager, I expect us to hit. We, our bats aren't here. We're using taped up bats. We're going to those sporting goods in stock and buying cheap bats. So the bats came. Now we're in a big slump. The bats come before the game, man, we just smell the wood, the white ash, and we're just like fondling these bats. And we know tonight we're going to break out of the slump. And we go out there and the guy throws a perfect game against us. I mean, we don't even have a foul ball. Hardly. <laughs> so now we're in the shower and our manager, who I love this guy, he, he takes dozens of the bats and he throws them in the shower with us he says bat order my ass and he storms off the book has some other things that i can't say on the air and uh, uh and we're all there starting naked with our beloved bats hitless bats getting wet so wondering what do we do now anyway that becomes a scene in the movie and um and that's typical of, of i think of how, how i try to tell the story in the book of where you take instances from your life and you reinvent them dramatically. As a matter of fact, you uh, you were actually told a pitch by a catcher. I'm not going to uh, ruin the ending there. People need to check the book out for that one. I went back and, and watched the, uh, the shower scene last night. That scene is great for so many reasons. And one thing that I don't think I've been amused enough by until last night was Robert Walls just slowly counting the Mississippis out to make sure everybody gets into the shower. For some reason, that struck me as the uh, the funniest point in that scene uh, just <laughs> about 12 hours ago. And that was Robert's idea. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. Uh, that's the kind of contribution that actors like Robert, you know, he's a stand-up comic, or others, Kevin, everybody would come up with ideas and some of them were good, some of them were bad. And that was my judge, you know, I'd say, yeah, let's use that. Or I don't think that works. But, um, and Robert has brilliant comic timing anyway. So yeah, he was, yeah. he was, he was golden for me. Robert Will was gold. You had a bunch of interesting casting stories. Roberts is a very interesting one. Uh, how Susan Sarandon ended up getting the part is very inspiring. And my gosh, I can't imagine anybody else in that role. Certainly curious as to who that hot actress was who decided to go basic instinct on you rather than, try and read the script and rehearse some of those lines. But it was also cool to read that Kevin Costner, who was the first person that you had cast, you'd basically give him the role once he has read the script and is in. Uh, he actually made a, a request before taking the role. What was that exactly? Well, Kevin, who was just on the verge of becoming a big star, I mean, this, this is really going to help push him over. Um, he, he said, no, I, I can't accept. I love the script. I, I totally trust you. But I have to audition in a batting cage for you, he told me. And I said, well, everybody tells me you're a good ball player. And he said, no, 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 you played professionally. I played in high school. I have to pass your test. So, I mean, no, I've never heard of an actor 
say something like that. So we drove out in LA, to a place in the Valley, the San Fernando Valley. It had a big, you know, like every city has them. It had batting cages where you put in a quarter for different speeds. It had the three miniature golf courses. It had the, the video arcade, you know, one of those places, you know. They're just teeming with people and kids and high school kids on dates and whatever. And we played catch, first of all, in the parking lot. And people were walking right by him because he hadn't yet become a star. You know, he was months away from nobody ever walked by him, not recognize him in the parking lot again. And he, I could, in one throw, I knew he was a ball player. Then we, and then we get in the batting cage, feeding quarters of this thing. And he, he's a, got a beautiful stroke, a beautiful stance. And then he says, by the way, I, I also can hit left-handed. I mean, you're hmm. kidding. So he starts hitting a stroke at him left-handed. And I just said, man, you're the guy. And in those days, there was no cell phone. So I had to go find a pay phone. And I called the studio and I said, hire this guy immediately before somebody else does. And, uh, you know, it was a great marriage and we became friends. And we later made 10 Cup together, which was a number one hit in the country, number one movie. And we're, you know, we're talking about making another movie after all these years. So I, I, I'd love to make another movie with him. That's very exciting. Yeah, Tin Cup may very well be the best golf movie of all time. You, uh, you pretty much have the market cornered there, Ron. And, uh, of course, everybody remembers Crash and his famous speech near the beginning of the movie. You obviously said that Sarandon speech that opened things came pretty naturally for you. You uh, got it onto a tape recorder first, and then you wrote it out after that. Was it uh, similarly easy for you in uh, writing out Crash's soliloquy there? Yeah, I wrote it as fast as I could type. I mean, I didn't even think about it. I just, what I was thinking about is I wanted him to say some things that were provocative and that would make anybody say, hey, I want to know more about this guy. Hmm. And, and, he, and in a certain way, he knows that's what she's going to say. But also I wanted the audience to say, this guy's, I've never heard anybody make that speech before. So the things he says are somewhat contradictory. First of all, I don't want my movies to appeal just, well, now we have a much more polarized nation culturally and politically, but I don't want to make movies for people who agree with me or disagree. I, I want to make movies that everybody can connect with in some way, you know? Um, and so he would say something that was appear to be a bit on the liberal side, and then he'd say something appear to be on the conservative side, and then something that would piss off everybody on all sides, you know, by the time he gets through the speech, um, where is this guy coming from? You know, uh, but, but, you know, he's smart, you know, he's different, you know, he's, he's had life experience and, you know, he's able to play games with the powerful Annie Savoy right off the bat. And she's never found anybody who could go toe to toe with him, you know, verbally or intellectually. So, so, and of course, she ends up with the wrong guy, and that's how you get through the first act. Unfortunately, he's never going to get his banning of the DH amendment. As a matter of fact, the opposite has now happened to Major League Baseball, Ron. Yeah, and I'm I'm on the minority. I really think the DH hurts baseball. Uh, um, I really do. Uh, some of the other changes I like. The problem with the DH is it takes strategy out. It, it means you handle your pitchers differently. Um, it's a game where now you can have a guy just – it, nothing else and that's not baseball it's not like hockey or football um it's like having a designated free throw shooter in in, in you know basketball or something mm -hmm. I, I like some of the changes i like i hope they they I, and i i'm all for the robo ups because they miss too many calls uh I, i'm i'm and it I'm, I'm all for the the speed time limit they're putting on pitching now they're going to start in the majors you got 14 seconds to throw the ball because the pitchers are killing us out there. And uh, the, the minor league games have been shortened 30 minutes. Do you realize that? 30 minutes. That's, good. that's a, good. That's great. Yeah. And all, all they're doing is saying to the pitcher, you got to throw the ball 14 seconds after you get it. Uh, I'm fine if you tell batteries, you can only get out of the box one time. In a bat. So that's my phone quacking in the background. <laughs> um, the. Uh, I, I hope they I've changed my mind. I think now they have to go back and not allow the shift because it's just, uh, you know, global technology is telling. Uh, so I, I think 
some of these are decent changes. I thought at first, I, I, at first I hated the x venting rule, but now I'm sort of, it's grown on me a little bit because even though it's not pure baseball, um, it sort of heightens the interest at the end of the game as opposed to, hey, we're going to go 17 innings and the crowd's going to leave. So I'm, I'm a little more sanguine with that one. Hmm. One of the most memorable scenes is one that you alluded to a little bit earlier, and that is the meeting on the mound. Why was the studio so <laughs> opposed to this scene, and what ultimately allowed you to keep it? Because studios are stupid. That's <laughs> the reason. Um, studios always are fighting the wrong fights. Always. Uh, you know, while I was shooting the movie, if the book tells you they wanted to fire Tim Robbins, they wanted to fire me. They fired the director of photography because they didn't think Susan looked good. Give me a break. Are you kidding me? Uh, they said the movie wasn't funny. It wasn't sexy. It wasn't romantic. This is while I was shooting it. And they said that um, nobody would ever believe that Susan Sarandon would end up in bed with Tim Robbins. All I can say to that is I'm the godfather of their firstborn. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and the movie's on everybody's list of the, Best sports movies, funniest movies, sexiest romantic movies. So I'm used to these fights with the studios. You just, you know, on 10 Cup, they said, why can't he win? I said, there's no movie if he wins. You won't even remember. It's boring. Um, so, uh, yeah, luckily, uh, audiences vo always voted for the meeting on the mound to be as their favorite scene. So the studio had to shut up and listen to the audience. Thank goodness. Now, there were several interesting scenes that ended up getting cut from this film. One was Annie giving an explanation as to why she is who she is. It starts with Crash asking her the question, why baseball? You talk about how these different characters that you came up with were amalgamations of various people you encountered throughout your real life. You mostly related to Cla uh, Crash, which I get, but it felt like in reading the dialogue from that speech, which you provided verbatim in this book, that you infused a little bit of yourself in Annie there when talking about the game and also your reluctance in giving it up. Am I reading that correctly? And what lesson were you able to learn from cutting that scene that you took forward as a, a filmmaker? Well, sometimes you have to cut your favorite scene to make the movie work better. It's a weird thing. I wrote a whole chapter about it called Kill Your Darlings, and I printed the entire scene because there's nothing wrong with the scene. In fact, it would have probably got her the Oscar. Uh, and she was great in it, and Kevin was great. I love the dialogue. The dialogue read excellent. And it, and it fills in everything you need to know about Annie. What I learned was, because it comes off a fight they had. They haven't gone to bed together yet. Nuke is still in between them. They can't get out of their own way. But what, what Annie it's so intimate what she shares about who she is and where she came from. And she's not, it, it, it's totally from the heart that it's, it's so intimate between them that the movie's kind of over. <laughs> they haven't got there yet, you know? Um, and uh, that's the big thing is, oh, now we have to wait for all the other stuff to play out so they can be together. So it got us to the end too quick. Um, and, um, in fact, the chap that article, the chapter I wrote, is what a literary agent saw that led him to say, Ron, if you keep, I can sell a book if you want to write the whole thing. And I, because I never intended to, but that chapter led to the book. So why baseball then, Ron? Well, there's a chapter called Why Baseball in the book at the very end. Uh, and I'll let you read it, but I, I try to assess why baseball, why all the great American writers write about baseball from Walt Whitman on, hello? I mean, Walt Whitman saw it in 1880 and he, and he, he, he thought it was our, the great American game and he went on about it. Updike, Halberstam, Gay Talese, uh, Michael Lewis, uh, John Updike, uh, uh, Marianne Moore, <laughs> the poet. Why There's something about the game that's just intrinsically American. I think it's the lack of a clock the fact that you're never actually dead and so there's always hope, which is a very American, that sort of optimism, which is both our, our, our greatness and a, and a curse in a certain way. Um, the, uh, I think um, the fact that it's a verbal game, I talk a lot about that. It's the only game that where guys on the opposite team are talking to each other throughout the game, even as they're, as they're trying to beat each other. I mean, where does that happen? Um, 
uh, I, I think that um, it's, a, it's a game that the slow pace of it and then a really fast pace and then slow and fast uh, appeals to us, you know, it's not nervous and on edge. And then when it is nervous on an edge, it's high, it's more heightened than any sport. So um, it's all of those things. It's rural. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's connected the Americas. I don't know. I talk about why baseball and, and I don't know why it, it gets such lyrical prose. I like it because it's vulgar and it's physical and it's funny and it's hard. And I think also something you touched on is that it, there's a lot of downtime. So there's a lot of time to tell stories. There's a lot of time to just chat it up with your teammates and even chat it up with your enemies too, which I thought was a great point that I never really considered before. You maybe get a tiny bit of that in other sports, but in baseball, you have one guy standing on first base, the other guy waiting to stand on first base to potentially pick him off. And they're, you know, they're asking about how things are going on the diamond and maybe with families too, if they're close enough. Yeah, and where the bar, where's the best bar that the girls, college girls hang out, you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, the ball players, I also make this point, uh, which I've made many times. Most, you know, fan, the Dodger fans hate the Giants, and the Giant fans hate the Dodgers. Uh, I mean, what's the, what's the, I mean, the Dallas, what is the, does the Texas Rangers have a, a rival? Who is their rival? They probably don't. It's kind of the Houston Astros now, but that's a weird one for somebody like you and I who, you know, we grew up in a time, and I grew up as a Rangers fan in the DFW area where the Astros were in the National League. So even that rivalry is certainly a thing now. <laughs> it's not a longstanding rivalry like Yankees-Red Sox. Let's, let's, let's take that. Red Sox fans hate the Yankees. Yankee fans hate the Red Sox. But Dodger players don't hate the Giant players. And the Yankee players don't hate the Red Sox, but those are fans' things. Who do the players hate? They hate they hate management. <laughs> yeah, management is always the evil. That's all of us are like. Don't we all hate management? I hate management. Yeah, nobody likes boss. Nobody likes having to answer to somebody. Right, and the management's the people trying to fire me and Tim Robbins, and just says that Susan doesn't look good. That's management. Management's saying cut the meeting at the mound out. That's management. I don't hate other filmmakers. I root for everybody's film, whether it's my kind of film or not. I want people to go to movies because it generates money that I could, <laughs> I can go make movies. So players are like that. They know that, I mean, the Dodgers, for all the, the they took a chance on Jackie Robinson, bullshit. They traded him to the Giants when they were done with him. You know, I mean, give me a break. Give me a break. I mean, Bill Vec tried to, tried to uh, integrate baseball before the O'Malley's. That's right. They wouldn't let him. And as soon as Robinson got in, he got Larry Doby in immediately. Vec was way ahead of all these other guys. Mm -hmm. So the afterword includes a page long summary of a sequel that never happened for Bull Durham. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend people uh, check that out. I have to admit, it sounded like a good idea. I think it would have worked. And it inspires visions for me of what Rick Linklater has done with the Before Sunrise series. My last question, though, for you, Ron, is I feel like you could give this same treatment to White Men Can't Jump and or Tin Cup. And there's a couple of other films that I think you could honestly do this for as well. Have you given any thought to either writing another memoir that encompasses a specific film or maybe something that uh, that takes the, the rest of your career on the whole? Because... This book was phenomenal. It was uh, very lucid. It was an entertaining read. It was a relatively quick read. You didn't really waste words. And I think uh, people could use more of this out of you. Well, I'd like to not write another making of movie. I'd rather write a movie. <laughs> okay. I'd rather make a new movie. I have a number of scripts out there that are close. A couple of television series. One's a Western set in Kansas and post-Civil War. One's a... Uh, another baseball movie. Uh, um, I have a working on a script from a famous great article by the great writer, Richard Ben Kramer about Ted Williams in his sixties, when the writer went down to the keys to interview him and Ted didn't want to be interviewed. And Ted was of course, notoriously difficult and about their time together and how the, the grudging mutual. Anyway, it's called, what do you think of Ted Williams now? It's a famous book. 
working on that. So I've got lots of things in the fire, um, but I'd rather I'd rather make more movies before I write about making them. <laughs> Would Costner be playing Ted? He'll have first shot at it, and he knows it. Oh, man, that would be awesome. All right, he is Ron Shelton, the legendary writer and director whose films include White Man Can't Jump, Blaze, Cobb, Tin Cup, and Bull Durham. The latter film, considered by many to be the best sports film of all time, is the subject of his excellent new book, The Church of Baseball, Home Runs, Bad Calls, Crazy Fights, Big Swings, and a Hits. Ron, thank you so much for the time today, and thank you for this wonderful book. Thanks, Trey. I appreciate it. Thank you to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to Joshua Bates for the video editing. If you have any video editing needs, hit him up on Instagram at Forger Digital. And thanks as always to you for checking us out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at BooksOnPod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day.